You may know him as the father of classical music, or perhaps you know him by his nickname, the Old Wig. But no matter how you know him, if you've been around music, you'll know the legendary prestige that is associated with the name Johann Sebastian Bach. But after hearing his name for the entirety of my musical career, I wanted to get to know Bach on a personal level. Who was he like outside of his music, outside of his career? Oftentimes we only hear about the good stuff in history, it seems. So I wanted to dive deeper. And when I did, I found some pretty interesting things that I really didn't expect. I'm Sam Vesley, and this is Tonicized. Fact one, Bach was a homebody. So I've lived in a few different cities in my life and each one of them offered different challenges and growing opportunities and I'm really grateful for every single city I've lived in. Bach, on the other hand, rarely traveled 200 miles from his hometown of Eichenstadt, where he was born on March 31st, 1685. Now, whether he just didn't like sleeping in different beds or he just, you know, liked to be at home, it's hard to say. Now, it's important to note here that Bach did travel outside of that 200 kilometer radius a few times, either for work or just for visiting. And he would go to countries that were really close to his hometown, like Germany. But that was about it. Bach didn't really travel too much. Now comparing that to today, we could jump on a plane and be in a different country in a matter of hours. Bach didn't have that luxury, and as a composer, I think this was probably to his benefit. I always find composing while on the road really challenging, and I have a computer and software and headphones that make it so easy to do. Bach had ink, quills, and paper, and that's all he really used. So. I could see how traveling would make composing a little bit more challenging for him. And it was probably more of a benefit to stay home more often than not. Fact two, Bach was a massive music nerd. Bach was known to be more of an organist or someone who played the organ professionally, more so than he ever was considered to be a composer in his time. But the one thing that wasn't arguable was that Bach was a massive music nerd. Bach had studied all of the Renaissance composers and current composers, his colleagues, and how they wrote music to the point where he understood counterpoint and musical form probably better than most composers at the time. And all of this studying and you know, figuring out the puzzles led to Bach writing really quote unquote good music. I bet if you went and looked for a Bach piece, you wouldn't find a piece that sounds bad. And when I say bad, just out of context noises or really harsh harmonies, Bach was precise with every harmony he wrote and everything sounds very meticulously placed, almost like a robot wrote it. Bach's music sounds like a musical puzzle and every piece just fits perfectly together. And this is what makes Bach so famous and well known around the world and in the music community. It's because his music just fits so well together. With his academic relationship to the art form, Bach became a very well-known musician later on in life because of his preciseness with every harmony and every song and every piece he ever wrote. Fact three, Bach went to prison. So picture this, Bach is working and writing music for this guy, William Ernst, the powerful Duke of Weimar. It sounds fancy, right? Well, this Wilhelm guy had a lot of money and is hiring Bach to write music for him. But Bach's ready to move on and take on a new chapter of his career. So instead of just letting him go on his way, William Ernst decides to put Bach in prison. Now granted, this is just for a brief time, but it's still prison. Bach really didn't do anything wrong. He just wanted to move on from his career and just got absolutely denied. Luckily though, he was able to spend his time in prison productively, creating a book called the Orgelbuchen, which is essentially just a bunch of organ piano exercises. Now, personally, I haven't looked through this Orgelbuchen, and yes, I had to look that up to know how to say it correctly, and I hope I'm saying it right, but there's about 45 different exercises in this book and Bach wrote them all in prison. There's also a really cool quote at the start of the book. It goes like this. In which it is given to the beginning organist to perform chorales in every kind of way and to perfect himself in the study of the pedal in as much as in the chorales to be found in it, the pedal is treated obligato to the honor of only the supreme God and the instruction of the neighbor. Okay, so this tells us a few things. Number one, Bach was a very religious man. And number two, even in prison, Bach was concerned with educating others in the art form of organ playing and just in the art form of music as a whole. 
I find it fascinating that even in prison, Bach was able to, you know, make light of the situation and create something that would inspire others in the art form that he was passionate about. I think it's safe to say that I wouldn't be doing that. I would be kind of worried about getting out as soon as possible. So, shout out to Bach for that. Fact four, Bach had 20 children. Okay, so this one is unfathomable to me. Like, okay, I get it. If you wanna have one kid, cool. Two kids, sweet. Three even, awesome. Five, cool. But 20 kids, 20 kids. Now I know that comparing the times of now to the times of then, I'm just gonna get disappointed. That's, that's just common knowledge, but I think this might explain why Bach wrote so much music. Putting that much food on the table for 20 kids at that time would be a huge undertaking, which is why I think Bach wrote so much music. The more music he wrote, the more he got paid, and the more he got paid, the more food he would be able to provide for his family. That's just my theory, anyway, but I think it's a pretty valid reason for why you would work so hard and write so much music. As much as Bach did, anyway. Fact number five. Bach lost both his parents when he was 10 years old. Now this would have had an emotional impact on Bach as well as a mental impact. And at that time, mental health wasn't as prevalent as it is today. So I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that Bach could have probably benefited from a few counseling sessions once in a while. The only positive that I could find with this scenario of his parents dying at such a young age was that his older brother, Johann Jacob Bach, was able to give Johann Sebastian Bach organ lessons. These lessons would become a keystone piece of Bach's musical career and kind of open the doors for his composing and his creating and, well, his worldwide recognition today. But if you ask me, losing your parents to develop these skills that you're gonna need for your career and your future, not a, quite a fair trade-off in my opinion. Fact number six, Bach's most terrifying piece of music. Bach wrote a lot of music and some of it's been used in a lot of movies and TV shows, but the spookiest piece that Bach ever wrote was something called Toccata in Fugue in D minor. It's written for organ, it's really recognizable, and you've probably heard it before in any spooky movie, or maybe some of the older spooky movies. Ba -da -da, ba -da 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 -da. Once I found out that this was Bach's spookiest piece, I went and looked to see how many views it had on YouTube. The most views I saw was over 49 million. So Bach's still rocking it today. If you want to check out that video, I've linked it down in the description below. You can click the link right after this video is done and go take a listen. If I were you, I would light a candle, one singular candle, turn off the lights and channel your inner villain while listening to this piece. It just makes it that much more fun to listen to. Or you could just skip the theatrics and just watch it like a normal human being. I'll let you decide which one you want to do. Fact number seven, Bach really liked beer. A Harvard professor and musician by the name of Christoph Wolf has studied Bach for a long time and kind of knows a thing or two about how he lived and his lifestyle. Wolf describes a trip that Bach took in 1713 where he went to the city of Hal to help an organ be placed into a church, the church being called Our Lady's Church. During this two week trip, the church paid for all of Bach's expenses and one of these expenses was 18 groschen or the currency at that time of beer, so 18 bucks worth of beer. Wolf explains that Bach's 18 groschens worth of beer in one night is equivalent to about 32 quarts of beer at retail price, meaning you're probably looking at about 4.5 pints, 1.1 growlers, or an entire six pack in one evening. With this historically accurate data, we can now kind of see a bigger picture of Bach as being a socialite, a partier, and a very heavy drinker. Whatever the measurement, one thing we should probably all hope is that Bach was drinking responsibly. Fact number eight, Bach received cataract couching or eye surgery. So I'm about to introduce you to a very cruel, cruel man who ultimately ended Bach's career and his life. This is John Taylor, self-proclaimed personal eye surgeon of King George II and the Pope and one heck of a scam artist. John Taylor's whole life was to just travel around Europe, avoiding the law and offer people miracle eye surgeries if they needed them or if they thought they needed them. Usually these surgeries didn't amount to any result at all and the uncured patients would be down a few bucks and be really mad at John who had already left the city about two weeks prior. Now you're probably thinking like, why wouldn't you just track him down? 
well, at that time it was hard to track people down. There was no Facebook search or company review or Google review that you could leave after some bad service. At a time where medical practices weren't always reliable, having someone walk into town proclaiming that they were the best eye surgeon ever and then have them cut your eye open doesn't sound like a very good time. But Bach was desperate, and by the age of 50, he had already developed cataracts in both eyes and was losing sight fast. This was why Bach went through with the surgery, and it was only after the surgery had happened that Bach had realized his mistake, because John left Bach completely blind. Not only that, but the tools that John used weren't sanitized, meaning that the surgery wasn't a sanitary surgery, and Bach developed infections in his eyes. Bach spent the last four months of his life trying to just cope with the pain before ultimately passing away after the surgery was completed. Imagine what other music Bach could have written had John not fixed his eyes and led to his demise. That rhymed, that was cool, I liked that, that rhymed. But in all seriousness though, it truly is a sad way for Bach's career to end and his life to end. And it's all thanks to this John guy. What a slime ball. Fact number nine, Bach didn't know the impact of his music. So Bach didn't publish a lot of his music, and it wasn't until his death where his music started to really kind of go around the world. Now, once Bach had passed away, all of his original manuscripts were divided up and given to his family. And unfortunately, we only have less than half of what Bach was initially supposed to have written which is kind of crazy to think about. But that being said, we still know that Bach had a massive impact on the musicians and the composers of the time. Composers like Haydn, Beethoven, and of course, Mozart, all of which had massive impacts themselves on music. So this unintentional legacy of Bach being kind of the centerpiece of musical pedagogy in the classical world is kind of a really neat thing that I really love about Bach. He didn't know he was doing something so great, yet there he was, impacting the music that we now know as classical music. It's a pretty cool legacy to go out on, if you ask me. Fact number 10, Bach's last words. Bach's last words were this, don't cry for me, for I go where music is born. Epic. <laughs> what a way to go out. To love music so much that that's your only focus when you're passing over to the afterlife is pretty phenomenal. And it shows that Bach's love for music is something that most of us will probably never understand. For Bach, it wasn't about the fame or the money or the glory of creating such beautiful mastered pieces of art. It was much bigger than that for him. Based on his final words, we can kind of deduct that he almost worshipped the music he studied and created. And by doing this, he was able to create the beautiful works of musical art that we now still listen to to this day. I think it's safe to say that Bach had a pretty interesting life, and going through this list and finding out all of this information was a really cool experience, and I would love to do it again for some other composers. So let me know down in the comments which composer you want to know 10 fun facts about next, and be sure to subscribe to the channel so you can keep up to date with every single video release. I'm Sam Vesley, and this is Tonicized.